Um, one thing from the earlier speakers this morning was that uh, someone raised the topic of bimodal IT. I think it was the gentleman in the back there. Bimodal IT is bunk, absolute and utter bunk. It doesn't work. All it causes is unhappiness because what it creates is a culture of haves and have-nots and you end up with a massive problem. Never, ever implement bimodal IT. It's a guaranteed way to make your life miserable. OpenStack is the future, but bimodal IT is certainly not. Guaranteed. So I'm going to talk about WANs. How many people have got a WAN in this room? Right? How many people spend a truckload of cash on it? Right? Lots and lots of money, and there's no way that we've ever been able to fix this. Just a quick warning on my presentation style. It's, I've been told that my presentation style is like a road accident. I hit a whole bunch of ideas and leave the pieces for other people to pick up. So beware. Um, I have all of my slides are available at a website called speakerdeck.com slash ethereal mind, which is my Twitter handle. You can go and download it. The deck is there now, if you, um, or you can get it from the site later. What's wrong with the WAN? We live in an era of cloud, of instant gratification, everything being done now. Yet I work in an industry in data networking where carriers force us to sign up for a 10-year contract, usually a 5 plus 5 with a 3-year termination. So there are people out there now literally sitting on 20-year, 10-year, 15-year contracts for bandwidth that they can never change inside of the life. Moving to the cloud doesn't take away that cost. They're stuck with it, right? We have this massive problem here in networking. Um, at the same time, carriers are under a great deal of pressure to reduce their cost. This uh, is, a, is a series of research items where internet transit pricing, that's where two carriers connect together, since 1998, this price has dropped from $1,200 per megabit second to less than 63 cents per megabit second. That's a roughly, if you take these numbers, roughly 30% per year bandwidth costs are dropping. So if you're a carrier, you're not making more money like EMC does out of its customers every year. Hurts, doesn't it, right, when that happens? They're making less, right? Even though they're investing in building out their networks, they get less and less money out of that. At the same time, they're matching that by reducing their capex. So the big carriers are now reducing their capex by 5 to 10% per annum. How does that work? We've got a real problem uh, in terms of getting that done. Perhaps the biggest thing in the internet or in networking today is that the mega trend is that the only thing where money is being spent is on technology that supports smartphones. Nobody in enterprise IT actually matters anymore. Enterprise IT is no longer the tail that wags the technology dog. What you get is the rejects and the crumbs that fall off the table from smartphones. Everything that you do now, every technology that you use is the leftover rubbish that consumer technology could not use. So the future of, it, of networking is massive increases in bandwidth. And internet bandwidth is cheap and readily available and it's being driven by this thing, not by us. Now that's a massive turnaround for networking professionals because it's us that built the carriers with our private WANs and our overpriced bandwidth and our willingness to pay luxury prices for all of our assets. Now we have devices in the network, and this is a quote, believe it or not, from Cisco. Cracked me up. We have a networking tools that are absolutely hard to use, that mammoth. Somebody wanted to deploy one application and the customer said it took us three months to change our routers. They had 10,000 routers and it took three months to roll out a single change to support a new app. Networking's got some real problems. More importantly, WAN is 40 to 80% of networking budgets. So if you talk to anybody who is a networking owner, they will tell you that their networking budget, it basically consists of three costs, of which 40 to 80% is WAN costs, that bandwidth cost that you pay for a private WAN. WAN performance remains a massive problem. Who, everybody knows that getting something to work across the WAN reliably relies quality of service, and it doesn't actually work. It's not quality, it's just trying to mitigate the issues that we have. Network engineers have these unique skills. They're often hard to deal with, they're cranky, they're a lot like storage, storage admins, right? They have this unique you know, ability to stroke the boxes that they've got and get stuff out of them. But that's not what the business wants anymore. The business doesn't want these people with specialist skills. The business just wants to be able to use the technology. Nevertheless, this is the way it works. Service providers take months to install circuits. It's not uncommon to take three months in this country or in America, it's six months to actually run the cables into buildings. So if you go and buy a private WAN, you're looking at a provisioning time of three to six months. This is one of the things that makes the cloud very attractive to your enterprise IT CIO, because he doesn't want to wait six months for a new internet pipe to come into his data center, private data center. If you're in a colo, it's a different story, but not too many people are in colos even today. 
They're talking about multi-year contracts for circuits, usually single companies. So if I buy a WAN contract, I'm normally buying from one supplier and I'm locked in for five to 10 years. It's a bit like an EMC VMAX, right? Can't get away. And migration is very difficult. If you want to migrate a network, like I did some work with The Gap recently, they're rolling out 3,500 sites in the US. To do an upgrade, I have to visit 3,500 sites. Anybody know how hard that is? Right? You've got one data center and you're having a good whine about your storage arrays. I've got 3,500 sites that I've got to try and hit. That's just a modest upgrade. It's a very small upgrade. And it also requires very tight coordination with service providers who are very poorly organized. Your average carrier is a bunch of idiots being organized by fools. They really don't know what they're doing. They're badly run businesses. We use dedicated bandwidth because history. Back in the 1990s, there was no concept of shared bandwidth. Everything was a TDM. Everything was a modem line. You dialed up a circuit. You got a 64K pipe from end to end, and you did a telephone call down it. That's the only reason we use private WAN bandwidth. We don't like shared. It's only historical. There's no reason not to. Literally, we live in a state today where most network engineers believe that shared bandwidth is an unnatural state. I must have my private NPLS. Right? I can't overload it. Remember before duplication came to storage? Because I know most of you are storage people, right? Before dupe, dedupe came to storage, I remember when dedupe came, everybody went, oh, you can't dedupe storage. We won't know how much capacity there is. We don't know. We're scared. We won't know how big our arrays are, right? Dreadful. Same thing happening in networking. Of course, the internet proves that shared bandwidth is absolutely a natural state, and it works. So business frustration. Service providers take months to install circuits. They want multi-year contracts for those circuits at locked-in revenue, and migration is very difficult. At the same time, we have new technologies coming along from consumers. So if I'm a CIO and I'm evaluating what I'm doing in my WAN, I'm now looking at smartphones driving investment in the internet capacity, which I've already talked about a bit before. This here, this is a wonderful, wonderful slide. You see this dark gray line? That's enterprise IT shrinking. That's laptops and desktops. That's the roll-off. Now compare that to smartphones and tablets. The driver of internet or the driver of WAN technology is a consumer market. More importantly, in the consumer market, we replace handsets rapidly. Everybody in this room probably replaces their handset every two or three years, at least, if not faster for some people, right? And this allows a growing, it's a growing market, there's more and more money pouring into it, and this allows them to iterate very quickly. So we're now talking about 5G. Anybody here tracking 5G networking? It's absolutely exciting, very, very stimulating. It's a bit like what Chris said earlier, he's looking into the future. If you're a networking person, you won't be using fixed landlines to your house. The idea of cable into your house is going to go away in the foreseeable future, 10 to 20 years max. Right? You will all be using 5G because of it. Let me give you some sense of that, and I'll talk about it in a little while. One of the things that's in 5G networking is there's a standard called NBIoT. It's a proposal coming up from Huawei out of China. They're talking about producing sensors with a single battery, battery operated, being connected to the network for 10 years. No need to unplug them, no need to put them into power, put in a CR3032 battery, you know, the little tiny 10p uh, size thing, put that in a device and it will run for 10 years over a, th over a 5G backbone in low power mode. So you'll be able to put sensors out wherever you want them to be and they'll be able to connect to the internet and send data back. Think about what that means for your private WAN. Right? You won't need to have routers in your branch. You will just be able to start having this. We're talking about 5G having a transmission density, which will allow you to terminate one gig DSL circuit, like one gig LAN circuits, like one gig circuits, for basically no effort whatsoever. There's talk of 10 gig tail circuits coming up on wireless, so 5G, right? in high density areas. This is absolutely changing the way that we look. Instead of running WAN to the branch, we used to use these cables into the ground. We're now talking about using wireless to the endpoint. That's right. So how does enterprise use it? Just quick, what's a high density area? Usually, say, a mall, shopping mall in London. So what they're talking about is increasing the aerial. So in the same way that hard disk drives are increasing their density, the 5G standards are now talking about the ability to um, 10 times the handsets at 20 times or, or 40 times the, the speed. 
So they're using the frequencies and in, um, increasing the aerial density to the point where, you know, your 4G network today is just in London sort of doesn't really work. You find sort of when you move around London, it doesn't go. They're talking about a whole bunch of new technologies in 5G that solve all of the problems that we've experienced with 4G in high density areas, right? So. So what does a WAN actually do for you? At a business level, what is it that your WAN does? It shares the resources in the data center. So literally your storage array is shared to all of the consumers around the, around the company using the WAN, right? Whether it's line of business supporting apps or email messaging and voice. And occasionally, you're sharing internet as well. And IP telephony um, is widely used but it's used only for cost avoidance. So one of the key factors that we have a WAN is so that we don't have to make telephone calls. I don't know how many people in this room want to run an IP telephony system. Anybody run the IP telephony, right? Anybody thought about how much it costs to run an IP telephony system? Yeah. Anybody done the numbers and found an iPhone's cheaper? No, not Skype. Yeah. You've got to have one of these to put Skype for business on it, right? If you do the numbers, you'll actually find that you can do a deal with the carriers in the UK, not in America, because American telecoms is not very cost effective. You can, sell, you can give your staff a cheap, um, an iPhone on contract cheaper than you can put an IP telephone on their desk. Right? You don't need a WAN anymore. And guess which one people actually want? <laughs> right? Cost of ownership is... You're also assuming that people are actually using those functions, which they aren't. <laughs> but they wouldn't if, but you'll find that a smartphone generally has much better functions than IP telephony. Yeah. So different, different people have different things. The vast majority of companies don't use those functions. Your average uh, IP, IPPABX has 440 functions in a handset. People use four on average. Um, there's none of those functions. Most people don't even know how to conference call on an IPPABX anymore, right? Everybody uses a conference service, yet your PABX does all of that. What about uh, Most people are switching to Skype for business or IP telephony. And once you're on, a, on an iPhone, you've got Skype handset. So why are you not using Skype? Or GoToMeeting or WebEx or an appropriate. Don't use WebEx. It's awful. Just use GoToMeeting, right? I hate WebEx. <laughs> God, I hate WebEx. OK. So I want to introduce you to a technology called software-defined WAN. Now, you've all heard about software-defined storage. You've heard about software-defined networking in the data center with its overlay technology. Everybody heard about that? Everybody knows about NSX and Cisco's ACI and all those software-defined technologies. Fundamentally, what we're doing is taking that same principle of software-defined control and moving it into the WAN. So let me just talk a little bit. This is what our existing WAN looks like. We have a core. Two core switches, a core routers here in the thing. We have some WAN provider, a bunch of branches, and nearly always these days the branches are connected to the internet as well. Because the branches have to be able to access SaaS services increasingly. So if you're running a financial institution, usually you need to be able to get to the internet to range access third-party service providers. Plus, you also want to backhaul all the data to the data center core where your storage and your computer is located so you can reach the line of business apps for banking apps, right? This is the expensive part. This is the cheap part. This is ubiquitous, used for everything. This is what you want to change. So what's inside a WAN? You might be surprised to find that a WAN is just a bunch of routers connected to each other with wires. Arguably, they're fiber optic wires, or dense wave division wires, or they're um, a wi -fi wireless backhaul, sometimes using 3G, 4G, microwave, whatever it is. But fundamentally, it's a bunch of routers like this, right? And then what's inside a WAN is exactly the same thing. So what we do is we build these um, internet connections, and they look exactly like a WAN provider. The, the internet is made of the same technology as a WAN. It looks the same. It operates the same. The only difference is you're sharing the bandwidth between one and the other. So what we do to make advantage of this in networking is we have the internet, and we plug in two SD-WAN devices. And these SD-WAN devices form a tunnel between them. Anybody here used a VPN? to connect to work, that's it right there. It could be IPSEC, it could be SSL, it could be a proprietary connection between these two devices, but I have two devices forming a tunnel between the two networks. So now what I can do is I can actually connect these SD-WAN devices to one internet provider, Virgin, 
you know, whoever it is, BT, whatever, or I could connect it to another provider over here. And then this device can form a tunnel over this one to here and this one to here. Or uh, this could be my private MPLS circuit. This could be a 4G, 5G, it could be wireless or whatever. All I have is a tunnel. Now because in the modern era, what x86 did in the data center, what x86 servers did, we now have the ability to put software onto these that does deep inspection of the packet. So now I can start to see the two types of traffic that goes in. Let's say I'm doing that, I'll go back to the gap example. What the gap are doing is as the data comes off the branch network here, they recognize some of it as card swipe data. And what they found was if they send the card swipe data over their private MPLS, it's very slow. So what they do is they recognize it in the device here, do application recognition, and send all of that over a 4G connection. Literally, every one of the gap branches has a 4G backup line. And what they found is they sent all of their credit card swipe data over the 4G network. Safely encrypted, right? FIPS 170 compliant, if that's your thing. Everything else goes out over an internet connection. So what they do is recognize it. In fact, what they do is they have two internet connections in a 4G, and they dynamically set these pipes up. Now, because these pipes are between two devices, we can monitor the performance of the pipe. And if the internet connection on one provider degrades, they just dynamically switch over to another one. So let's say I'm sending traffic out through an SD-WAN device and here's my 3G network. Maybe my 3G network degrades because somebody boosts up a microwave in the next room. I then say this tunnel's not working very well. I will dynamically flip to this one over here running by my cable. And when this service comes back up, I flip back, ultimately dynamically. Right. Very, very good. What I can also do is something called load sharing. I can actually start to send load over this connection and I can send some load over this connection. How many people have got WANs that do active and standby? Active and backup. Storage arrays. How many people have got an active standby storage array? You realize that you just wasted 50% of your investment when you did an active standby? Why are you not using all of it, right? So when we talked about doing erasure coding across all of your possible arrays, it means you're actually getting in towards 100% utilization of your systemic infrastructure, right? One of the great things about these SD-WAN appliances is you can have two of them, but you can now start to use your active and your backup circuits. So you can use two circuits at the same time to get performance. And then if one of these pipes, if, the if one of these internet services goes down, then I run in a 50% degraded situation. Today in networking, we run in a 50% degraded situation as normal. And the other side can't be used. We can only do one side at a time. Yes, but you've still, sure, but what you've just done is you've bought two cars and you're driving both of them at the same time with all the expenses in fuel and operating and maintenance. Consciously, I've done that though for a reason, to keep the business going at all. A lot of people don't do it consciously and they don't do it for the right reasons. And certainly in networking, it would be much better if we could use 100% of our bandwidth all of the time and then run in a degraded state for that one day of the year. But in networking, we can't do that, right? In networking today, we can only have one path active at a time. It's not possible to load balance over equivalent paths. I've only got 20 minutes, so I've had to cut this presentation. This is actually a cut down version of a three hour presentation, right? What I'm saying here is in SD-WAN is this is a real revolution in networking because over here we have these situations in the cloud where these SD-WAN appliances are centrally controlled. So I was talking earlier about the gap the gap is rolling out, and those 3,000 sites that I was talking about, they are literally rolling out 20 sites a day. So they pick up a box from a company, they go along, they plug it into the WAN, into the internet connection at the, new, at the site that they're upgrading. It dials home over the internet to a central site on the cloud. Its configuration comes down, and it's ready to go. So what they have is a warehouse full of parts, and they've hired a company to just put them in the back of a car and a guy drives from one site after the site after another, and they're rolling out 20 sites a day. Anybody want to guess how long it used to take to upgrade a network of that size before software-defined WAN came along? 
Typically, we would have expected that to take three years. They're going to finish it in four and a half months. Um, the stories that the gap tells, I did another one with a financial institution with software-defined WAN technology. Um, the, they're doing a 100-site upgrade. He's managed to cut his WAN budget by 80%. And he expects to cut it by 90% once the project finishes because they changed the way it's working inside. He is pulling down over $1.5 million a year in savings on 100 sites worth of networking. Software defined WAN is going to be the future. I don't have too much more to say about it, except the advantages of software defined WAN is that you avoid long term WAN contracts. If you're going to go take a takeaway out of this, don't go and sign up to any more long term contracts with your service providers. Just forget about it. You can go and get a software defined WAN solution, which is really easy to use. If you're thinking that this is something for you, get out there and start evaluating software defined WAN products. You can come and listen to my podcast. We've done interviews with 12 of the major SD WAN vendors and they talk about their technologies in details. Come and start having a listen, start talking to the SD-WAN vendors and see if they've got products that suit you. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, and importantly, you're going to have to start engaging with your security idiots, I mean uh, de de department, because it's a radical change to start connecting everything to the internet. Um, if you start connecting everything to the internet, you're going to need to give your security people a year or two to catch up, including your WAN traffic, because they're going to have a hissy fit. Right? You need to start doing that. I'm done. Has anybody got any questions? I have. Uh, Greg, I work in an industry where I build networks that only have a lifespan of maybe one or two weeks. Yes. Um, bringing bandwidth into some of these sites uh, is a real challenge. Mm -hmm. So I've started eating a lot of seeds. Um, the kitchen contracts I work for Live Nation, I build new festivals. Um, bringing bandwidth into sites can be a challenge. It's yep. quite expensive. Mm -hmm. It's one answer, or it's yesterday's answer, right? P fine solution, Vipranet's not, to, not a bad solution. I haven't, caught it, I haven't got it in the top of my head. I'd have to go and do some reading. So but Vipranet essentially bonds from one device and then yep. rebuilds the packets in a data center that yep. you come out and that's your internet. So you get an end-to-end -end connectivity, but it, what it means is that you can bring in and bond over the telcos. Yes. Device. Yep. What have you got on so software-defined WAN does the same thing, right? Um, I think Vipranet's solution is that it's specifically designed for a mobile situation. And there's about eight or nine vendors in the Vipranet space, all with a slightly different take. I've got one that does it on cruise ships, another one that does it for vertical markets. You'll see a lot of these overlay networking technologies being used by IoT devices. So a lot of the companies doing IoT are using this type of technology. Um, in terms of channel bonding, it depends on your unique... You're in a unique situation where you set something up, you run it for two days and you tear it down. I'd be looking at other people like Cradlepoint, like Elfique, like um, Fatpipe, uh, like uh, Baru Networks, which is TCP acceleration, one-sided TCP acceleration. Baru, B-A-D-U Networks. What they actually do is they do TCP munging in the flight on one-sided to get much more tighter packing of the bandwidth. It, um, it would, getting it to work with Vipernet might be a bit of a problem. Sorry, I'm getting off topic a little bit here, but. Um, I would look at these software-defined WAN providers because what you'd be able to do in the UK is have 3G modems from four different providers and it would automatically select the best path without any of the reassembly stuff that you need. These, and these guys have application recognition engines that will dynamically switch between paths. Yeah. So they're all the same sort of thing. Anyone else? Yeah, quick one. Um, so with uh, quality of service and actually picking something which is inherently not necessarily that good quality, like a 4G network or mm -hmm. because of interference or, or an internet provider, for example, does that cause a big issue in getting a defined quality of service across those connections? Apparently not. So what we're finding is that um, people who install software-defined WAN find that private MPLS works worse than everything else. Now, mostly that's because if you're, let's say, for example, you're buying a 10 meg private MPLS circuit which costs $5,000 a month, or $10,000 a month, and you can go and buy a 100 meg internet service for $500 a month. It's the 100 megs of bandwidth that has more impact than, the, than whether the network is dedicated or non-dedicated. So what we're finding is it's not a quality of service issue, it's a quantity of service. Faster is always better. The, or the solution to every networking problem is more bandwidth. If I go to the internet and buy 100 meg, 
and you're having performance problems, guess what happens? Go and buy a gig and you'll solve all your performance problems. Now there are backbone problems and things like that and there are SD-WAN providers like VeloCloud um, who specialize in routing traffic across the internet. I didn't put all that in here because I didn't have time but they specialize in routing traffic across the internet in the most optimal form. So they can accelerate traffic as it traverses the internet backbone because they have pops all over the world and they push it in. So the, the internet is not an optimized architecture. It's a best effort, in fact it's a rubbish architecture. Um, so what we do is there are companies now out there who optimize the internet. There are ways to monitor the internet to know if it's performing well or not and that requires an additional service but that's not something I can cover in 25 minutes. The answer is um, you'll find out that internet runs better than private MPLS. <laughs>